Hello, and welcome back to TED Climate, a podcast from the TED Audio Collective. I'm your host, Dan Cortler, and today's topic is a big one, renewable energy. It should be pretty obvious at this point that we need to divorce ourselves from our dependence on fossil fuels, not only because they contribute massively to pollution and climate change, but also because these sources are finite. They just won't last forever. Globally, we use 35 billion barrels of oil a year, and scientists estimate that we've consumed about 40% of the oil that there is. At this rate, it's predicted that we'll run out of oil and gas in about 50 years, and we'll run out of coal in about a century. The good news is that we're actually surrounded by an abundance of energy sources that are renewable, meaning that we won't use them up over time. I'm talking about water, wind, and that giant ball of fire in the sky that radiates so much energy it literally powers every form of life on Earth. It's the sun. I love the sun. So the question is, could we completely replace fossil fuels with clean energy? Well, like I said, the problem isn't where we'd get the energy we need, but how we can harness this power and distribute it cheaply and effectively. This is actually a huge challenge. So let's dig into why that is and how we can overcome it. To understand if we can realistically power the world with renewables, we need to first understand our global energy use, which is a diverse and complex system. So for now, let's focus on two of the most familiar energy sources in everyday life, electricity and liquid fuels, like gasoline or diesel. Let's start with how renewables can meet our electricity needs. The good news is that our technology is already advanced enough to do this. And there's an ample supply of energy coming from the sun. I mean, this thing continuously radiates about 173 quadrillion watts of solar power. That's almost 10,000 times our present needs. To harness this energy, it's been estimated that we'd need a solar capturing surface that spans several hundred thousand square kilometers, something in the neighborhood of, you know, the size of California. So why don't we just build that? Sounds easy, right? Well, there are other hurdles in the way, too, like where we set up these panels and how we get the electricity to where it needs to go. To maximize efficiency, solar plants must be located in areas with lots of sunshine year-round, like deserts. But those are typically far away from densely populated regions where the energy demand is high. There are other forms of renewable energy we could draw from, such as hydroelectric, geothermal, and biomasses, but they also have limits based on availability and location. In principle, a connected electrical energy network with power lines crisscrossing the globe would enable us to transport power from where it's generated to where it's needed. But building a system on this scale faces an astronomical price tag. The infrastructure for transporting energy would also have to change dramatically. Present-day power lines lose like 6 to 8% of all the energy they carry just because wire material dissipates energy through resistance. Longer power lines would mean more energy loss. Superconductors could be one solution to this problem. Such materials can transport electricity without dissipation, but they only work if they're cooled to low temperatures, which requires more energy and kind of defeats the whole purpose. To benefit from that technology, we'll need to discover new superconducting materials that operate at room temperature. So there are still challenges to solve before we can fully replace our electric needs with renewable energy, but there are smart people on the job. Now, what about the all-important oil-derived liquid fuels that power most of our vehicles? Well, ideally, we could just leave them behind and transition to fully electric cars. The scientific challenge there is to store renewable energy in an easily transportable form. Recently, we've gotten a lot better at producing lithium-ion batteries. These are the ones that are in your phones. You know, they're lightweight, they have high energy density, but even the best of these can only store about 1 20th of the energy in one kilogram of gasoline. To be truly competitive, car batteries would have to store much more energy without adding cost. These challenges only increase for bigger vessels like ships and planes. To power a cross-Atlantic flight for a jet, we'd need a really heavy battery that would significantly weigh down the plane. This too demands a technological leap towards new materials, higher energy density, and better storage. One promising solution would be to find efficient ways to convert solar into chemical energy. And this is already happening in labs, but the efficiency is still too low to allow it to reach the market. To find novel solutions, we're going to need lots of creativity, innovation, and powerful incentives. The transition towards all renewable energies is a complex problem involving technology, economics, and politics. But there's ample reason to be optimistic that we'll get there. Top-notch scientific minds around the globe are working on these issues and making breakthroughs all the time. And many governments and businesses are investing in technologies that harness the energy all around us. 
Okay, so even though we can't fully transition to renewable energy just yet, the technological innovations in this field are happening at such a rapid pace that I personally believe we can get there. For example, we already have potential solutions to electrifying planes. There's actually a really cool TED Talk by Corey Combs about this work, so check that out on TED Talks Daily if you want to learn more. Unfortunately, (laughs) you knew it was coming, these technological advances can pose their own problems, risking the health of people and habitats. As an example, let's look at the world's largest hydroelectric plant and the controversies around its construction. A hydroelectric dam is essentially a massive gate which redirects a river's natural flow through a large pipe called a penstock. Rushing water flows through the penstock and turns the blades of a turbine, which is attached to a generator in an adjacent power station. The churning of the blade spins coils of wire inside a magnetic field, producing a steady supply of electricity. And because the penstocks can be sealed at any time, a dam can hold back excess water during stormy seasons and save it for dry ones. This allows hydroelectric dams to produce power regardless of the weather, while simultaneously preventing floods further downstream. These benefits have long appealed to China's Hubei province. Located near the basin of the Yangtze River, this region is prone to deadly floods during rainy seasons when the Yangtze's flow is strongest. Plans to build a dam that would transform this volatile waterway into a stable source of power circulated throughout the 20th century. But when construction on China's Three Gorges Dam finally began in 1994, the plans were epic. The dam would contain 32 turbines, 12 more than the previous record holder, South America's Itaipu Dam. The turbines would supply energy to two separate power stations, each connecting to a series of cables spanning hundreds of kilometers. Electricity from the dam would reach power grids as far away as Shanghai. And stretching over 2.3 kilometers, Three Gorges Dam isn't just the world's largest hydroelectric plant, it's capable of producing more energy than any other power plant on Earth. However, the human costs of this ambition were steep. To create the dam's reservoir, workers needed to flood over 600 square kilometers of land upstream. This area included 13 cities, hundreds of villages, and over 1,000 historical and archaeological sites. The construction displaced roughly 1.4 million people and the government's relocation programs were widely considered insufficient. Many argued against this controversial construction, but others estimated that the lives saved by the dam's flood protection would outweigh the trauma of displacement. Furthermore, raising the water level upstream would improve the river's navigability, increase shipping capacity, and transform the region into a collection of prosperous port towns. When the project was completed in 2012, China became the world's largest producer of electricity. In 2018, the dam generated 101.6 billion kilowatt hours. That's enough electricity to power nearly 2% of China for one year or to power New York City for almost two years. That is a truly astonishing amount of energy. And yet, two years earlier, South America's Itaipu Dam, which is less than half the size of Three Gorges, actually generated more electricity. This is because the Yangtze's seasonal changes keep Three Gorges from reaching its theoretical maximum output. The Itaipu Dam, on the other hand, is located atop what was previously a waterfall, allowing for a constant flow of water. But as you might have guessed, the construction of the dam destroyed this natural wonder, which, by the way, used to be the planet's largest waterfall by volume. This dam rivalry is far from over, and other projects like the Inga Falls Dam and the Democratic Republic of Congo are also vying for the title of the most powerful power plant. But whatever the future holds, governments will need to ensure that a power plant's environmental and human impact are as sustainable as the energy it produces. So, as with everything, we need to consider the impact that our human systems have, even when we're building systems to help reduce that impact. Transitioning to renewables is great. We should definitely do it 100%. But let's not repeat the mistakes we made with fossil fuels. Our hunger and reliance on energy can't blind us from how we get it. Sorry to get preachy there for a minute. It's just that, ugh, you guys, renewables are so great. I don't want us to mess this up. I mean, why didn't we care about all this until now? It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that the sun is really strong. Anyways, while engineers figure out how we can utilize this power all over the globe, we individually can also look into replacing some of our own energy sources. 
Consider supplementing your electricity with solar panels. And if you drive a lot, maybe check out electric cars. Also, just try using less energy if you can and unplug stuff when you're not using it. Thanks as always for tuning in. More next week on how we can change climate change. You can also get involved by joining Countdown, TED's global initiative to accelerate solutions to the climate crisis in collaboration with future stewards. Find out more at countdown.ted.com. TED Climate is produced and edited by Sheena Ozaki, mixed by Sam Baer, and hosted by me, Dan Cortler. This episode adapted two lessons originally produced in animated form by the TED-Ed team. The first, Can 100% Renewable Energy Power the World, was written by Federico Rosé and Renzo Rosé, with support from Emma Bryce and Alex Rosenthal, and fact-checked by Francisco Diaz. The second, Building the World's Largest and Most Controversial Power Plant, was written by Alex Gendler, with support from myself and fact-checked by Ed Germa. Special thanks to Alex Rosenthal, Gertrugello, Michelle Quint, Ben Ben Chang, and Anna Phelan. Thank you.